Now, in illustrating personal development, Mr. Shaw, my teacher, started with money. You know, money is not the only place to start when talking about personal development, but it's where he began. So, let me share the thoughts he shared with me back then, and let me share them with you. Here's the best lesson I can give you on economics. It's very simple. We get paid for bringing value to the marketplace. That's about as simple as I can put economics. We get paid for bringing value to the marketplace. Now, it takes time to bring value to the marketplace. However, we do not get paid for time, so we cross that out. Mistakenly, the man says, I'm making about $20 an hour. That's not true. If it were true, you could just stay home and have them send you money. So, we don't get paid for time. We get paid for value brought to the marketplace. Now, since that's true, here's one of the key questions I want to talk to you about today. Is it possible to become twice as valuable to the marketplace and make twice as much money in the same time? Is that possible? The answer is yes. Could you become three times as valuable as you might be right now to the marketplace and make three times as much money in the same time? And the answer is yes. Five, ten times? Of course. America is unique. It's a ladder that starts down here. Let's say at $5 an hour, and it keeps going up. Top income last year was $80 million. The guy who runs Coca-Cola. Now, that's a heck of a ladder. That's why everybody wants to come here, right? The boat people are not headed for Vietnam. People haven't plotted and schemed for 50 years saying, if I could just get to Poland, everything would be okay. Not true. Everybody wants to come to America, and the reason is because we've got the best wind ever blowing in our favor. We've got the best economic opportunity anybody's had in 6,000 years, and all you have to do is understand it and take advantage of it. Now, there are some key questions to ask here. Why would the marketplace pay someone only $5 an hour? Very simple answer. They're not very valuable to the marketplace. Now, we must underline to the marketplace. This person might be a very valuable brother, yes. Member of the family, valuable, yes. Valuable member of the church, of course. Valuable citizen of the country, yes. Valuable in the sight of God, no doubt. We're all of equal value in the sight of God. But if you're not very valuable to the marketplace, you don't get much money. You say, well, it shouldn't be that way. Well, then you've got to start your own country. You know, this one's been in process for 200 years. And this is the best we've been able to come up with so far. But here's the key. You don't have to stay. You know, there was a big debate in Congress last year that $5 was not enough. Should be six, should be six, should be six. But we don't need legislation. Six is already on this ladder. The next step up. You know, if you work for McDonald's, they'll pay you $5 an hour to take out the trash. If you whistle while you take out the trash, they'll pay you $6 an hour. So, we don't need that legislation. You just need to take lessons on how to whistle and have a good attitude. Now, as you begin to climb this ladder, why would the marketplace pay some people $50 an hour? The answer is evidently, they must be more valuable to the marketplace. 10 times more valuable. And is that possible for someone to be 10 times more valuable and earn $50 an hour instead of 5? The answer is yes. That's what America is all about. Now, why would the marketplace pay some people $500 an hour? Evidently, this person must be much more valuable to the marketplace. And would the marketplace pay one person $80 million for one year's work? And the answer is, of course. If you hope the company make a billion dollars, would they pay you $80 million? I'm telling you, it is possible. And that's why America is so exciting. That's why this financial ladder is so exciting. It's possible for all of this to come true for all of you, no matter where you start. As a student in school, just getting started out there in the workplace, this is all possible for you. There are other ways to become valuable. To your family, valuable to your friends, valuable to the community, valuable to the team effort. But here's what he said to me. In climbing this ladder economically, all you have to do is work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Once I heard that, it made sense to me. I kept hoping that everything else would change around me. I found out that if I went to work on myself, worked on my skills, worked on my language, if I became better than I was each year, 
If I grew in skills and language and vocabulary and competence, then I would become attractive to the marketplace. Not very long ago, a company called me and said, Mr. Owen, we're expanding internationally, so we'd like to have a bit of your expertise to help us. Would you give us a bit of your time? We'll add some millions to your fortune. And I said, okay. And I thought later, isn't that interesting? They would call me. Then my second thought was, of course they'd call me. Would they call? I can get the job done. Now, what a contrast for me. A farm boy from Idaho, raised in obscurity, parents of modest means, broke when I was 25. How come I would get a telephone call, someone offering me a lot of money to help them in expanding around the world? Simple answer. Evidently, something happened to me between age 25 and where I am today. And I can tell you where it all started. From my teacher, Mr. Shaw, who said to me, we don't have to change what's going on out there. That's the wind that's blowing. All we have to do is change what's going on in here. Now, there are several ways to do that in personal development. Let me give you those ways. Here's the first one. We must learn from personal experience. Pretty simple. Learn from what happens to you. Take a look back over the last few months. Did you make some mistakes? How could you correct those for the future? Take a look back over the last year. Have you done it right or done it wrong? Let's correct it for the next year. Learn from your personal experience. Mr. Shaw asked me when I first met him. He said, Mr. Ron, how are you doing? You've been out there now six years. And I said, I'm not doing very well. He said, I suggest you not do that anymore. What a simple, swift analysis to my situation. He said, if you keep doing it, the next six years will be like the last six. You don't want that to happen. Let's make the changes. So, learn from your personal experience. Now, here's number two. Other people's experiences. That's me. Other people. That's your teacher. Other people. That's your friends and colleagues. Other people. The people you meet that can pass along to you their experiences. What's happened to them. The mistakes they made. How they corrected them. How they changed their health. Changed their bank account. And changed their income and changed their future. Other people. Now, there are two kinds of people to learn from. One is failures. Failures don't give seminars, right? That would be valuable. Bring your notebook. Have them tell you how they lost it all, and threw it all away, threw their health away, and threw their friendships away, and things didn't work out well. That would be valuable. But then we must also learn from positive people that have done well. They've got the health, the skills, the income. So, we ask them, how did you become so healthy? How did you become this skillful? How did you get here in such a short period of time? So, here's what's important in personal development and learning from other people. We learn, number one, by observation. We learn what we see. We watch people that are successful in what they do. In sports, we watch their disciplines. In business, we watch their disciplines. By observation, what we can see. The reason I created this video is something that you could see. Someone's experience is translated for you. Second, we learn by what we hear. I've got some of my lectures on cassette tape, but you can take them with you wherever you go and learn by listening. Turn your car into a mobile classroom and listen. And then listen to the sermon on Sunday morning. Listen to lectures. Listen to the teacher. Listen to someone who's got something good to say. And then, number three, is vitally important in personal development, and that is read. All the books you can possibly read in your lifetime. Mr. Shaw got me started on my library. I've got one of the better libraries. You haven't read everything in it, but you feel smarter just walking in it. By library, reading the books, attending the classes, making sure that I got in front of people that had something good to say. And then I started keeping a journal. One of the major things my teacher taught me was to keep a journal. He said, don't trust your memory. If you hear something good, just make a little note and write it down. Now, at first, I took notes on some pieces of paper, torn off corners and backs of old envelopes, and it didn't serve me well. You know, thrown in a drawer. And I learned to keep a journal, a bound copy of all my notes. So, I would suggest you do the same. Things that impress you, a poem that impresses you when you attend a class, some of the ideas that impress you, jot them down. You read something in a magazine, write some ideas. Take those out, put them in your journal. Keep a good journal the rest of your life. This will serve you well.
My journals make up a significant portion of my own library. And if you saw my library and saw my journals, I tell you what, you'd have to say, this is the library and these are the journals of a very serious student. No wonder Mr. Ron is invited to lecture and speak on his experiences around the world. So, I want the same thing to happen to you. Value captured that you can resort to later, go back over it, and review it, and let it become valuable to you. So, that's my first subject, personal development. Work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Develop the skills, learn the lessons, take the classes, absorb all that is being taught to you these days. And then, later on, of course, you can sort out what's valuable to you and how to refine it for your business and for your life and for your future. But the main thing is to get it and start this process of personal change, personal development. And let me say it one more time, if you will change, everything will change for you. You'll never be the same. You'll keep growing as you look back on a few months, look back on a few years. You won't believe the progress you can make economically, your relationship with your family, your friends, and whether you're in sports or economics or whatever. I'm telling you, that whole process of committing yourself for personal change, personal value, can really make your life unique and worthwhile. Now, setting goals. Let me show you something that turned me every way but loose. I've never been the same since I found out about it. Learning how to set goals. Not long after I met Mr. Shaw, we're having breakfast one morning. Mr. Shaw said, Mr. Ron, now that we've gotten acquainted, we know each other fairly well. He said, maybe one of the best ways I can help you is, let me see your current list of goals. Let's go over them and talk about it. And I said, what? I don't have a list. He said, well, Mr. Ron, if you don't have a list of your goals, I can guess your bank balance within a few hundred dollars. Which he did. And that got my attention. I said, you mean my bank balance would change if I had a list of goals? He said, drastically. So that day, I became a student of setting goals, and I've used it to dynamically affect my life. I taught it to some of my business colleagues. We used it to do business around the world. Setting goals can turn out to be a drama for your life. Here's what goals are. Your vision of the future. Your vision of the future. Now, there are two ways to face the future. One with apprehension, two with anticipation. Guess how most people face the future? With apprehension, a major reason why. They don't have it well designed. They've left the design of their future to somebody else. And if you don't make plans of your own, guess what? You'll probably fall into someone else's plans. Guess what? Someone else may have planned for you. Not much. If all your negative relatives turn positive, what will that do for your future? Not much. If prices come down a little, what will that do for your future? Not much. If the economy gets a little better, what will that do for your future? Not much. If circumstances get a little better, what will that do? Not much. If the weather gets a little better over the next few years, that'll do not much. I mean, you can go right down this whole scenario list. How most people live all their lives with their fingers crossed, count on this, not much. That's why 10 years from now, They'll be driving what they don't want to drive, living where they don't want to live, wearing what they don't want to wear, doing what they don't want to do, having what they don't want to have, maybe become what they didn't want to become. And all starts by counting on something that's not going to count much. You say, well then, how come my life dramatically changed? You got to count on yourself. And here's one of the things you've got to count on, your ability to design the future. It's called the promise of the future. If you'll design it well, it can have an awesome effect on your life. But if you face the future with apprehension, you'll take hesitant steps all day, uncertain steps all day. And if you take uncertain steps all day for six years, you can imagine how empty your life can be. We've got to help our kids with the promise of the future. Now, here's what's connected to the promise, the price. The price to pay. But I'm telling you, the price is easy if the promise is clear. One of the better notes to make for today. The price is easy if the promise is clear and powerful. But the price seems almost too much to pay, too much to get over, or too much to accomplish if the promise isn't clear, if the promise isn't powerful. I'm telling you, kids will pay the disciplines if they can see the promise. One of our biggest challenges as parents in the 90s is to help our kids see the promise of the future. That's why I'm teaching financial independence, 
that to become wealthy and powerful and sophisticated and healthy and unique. All the stuff kids would hope to go for, it's all possible. This is America. That's the promise of the future. The price. A few simple disciplines practiced every day. And I'm telling you, the kids will pay the price of the simple disciplines if they can see the promise of the future. But if they can't see it, they don't want to pay. And the same is true of all of us. We will pay the most extraordinary disciplines if we can see the promise of the future, called setting goals. So, I'm asking you to get a handle on the future. I'm asking you not to leave it to anyone else. Don't leave it to the company. Companies have their own goals. I'm asking you to set your own goals, your personal goals, income goals, financial goals, health goals, spiritual goals. Where do you want to go? What do you want to do? What do you want to see? What do you want to be? That's it. Promise of the future. Design your own future. It's within your hands, within your capacity to do so. Here's how simple goal setting is. It's not mysterious. You don't have to anchor. You don't have to focus. You don't have to visualize. No, that's here's how simple goal setting is. It changed my life. Decide what you want and write it down. I mean, that's how profound this stuff is. Decide what you want and write it down. Make a list. Where do you want to go? What do you want to do? What do you want to see? What do you want to be? What do you want to have? What do you want to share? What projects would you like to support? What would you like to be known for? What skills would you like to learn? Some extraordinary things you'd like to do. Ordinary things you'd like to do. Silly little things you'd like to do. Very important things you'd like to do. Decide. Decide on all that stuff and write it down. Write it down. Write it down. That's how simple this stuff is. And it's your own private list. If it's really private, you know, on your list, put some stuff in code and nobody can understand it. If this list fell into unfriendly hands and simple things, whatever, false things, doesn't matter. It's your list. Keep your list. I keep my list in my journal so that I can go back five years ago. Here's my list. And I'm a little embarrassed. Here's what I thought was so important. Now, how my philosophy has changed from 10 years ago, five years ago, three years ago. Here's my old list. Here's my new list. Here's what's valuable to me now. Here's what I want my life to be now. Here's where I want to go, what I want to do, what I want to see. Keep your list of goals so that it shows your growth, shows your ability to change and grow. Your philosophy grows and expands. What's valuable? Setting goals. It doesn't matter how small, foolish it is. Put it on your list. My Japanese friend, Taro, put on his first list, a Caucasian gardener. Good morning. I thought that was good. I like that. Have you got this profound thing now? In setting goals, here's how profound it is. Decide what you want and write it down. Get together with your wife, decide. Get together with your kids, decide. Get together with your business colleagues, decide. Write it down, make a list. Okay, that's how easy it is. Now let me give you one more scenario on setting goals. When I started making my first list, Mr. Schaefer said, Mr. Owen, Looks like we're going to be together for a while. He said, I've got a suggestion for you. You're a 25-year-old American male. Sure, you made some mistakes, but now you're on the road to better things. You've got a family worth it. Reasons make the difference. He said, you've got every reason to do this. Why don't you, among all the goals you're going to set, why don't you set a goal to become a millionaire? A millionaire. This is America. All the possibilities are available. Why don't you set a goal to become a millionaire? He said, it's got a nice ring to it. A millionaire. Enough zeros to impress your accountant. A millionaire. And he said, here's why. And I thought that man doesn't need to teach me why. I'm thinking, wouldn't it be great to have a million dollars? He said, no, that's not it. Here's why. And I had one of the greatest lessons I ever learned and I'm about to share it with you. This will be worth the price of being here today if you can capture what I'm about to share with you, babysitter fees, whatever else you pay. Some of you missed some sales today to be here. So this is a costly day for you, but what I'm about to share with you changed my whole life. Here's what Mr. Schaefer said. Set a goal to become a millionaire. And he said, here's why. For what it will make of you to achieve it. And I got one of the greatest lessons in one sentence I ever received in my life. Set a goal that'll make you stretch that far for what it will make of you to achieve it. 
What a brand new reason for setting goals. What an all-encompassing challenge to have a better vision of the future. What for to see what it will make of you to achieve it. And here's why. The greatest value in life, what you get. The greatest value in life is what you become. The major question to ask on the job is not what am I getting here? That's not the major question. The major question to ask is what am I becoming here? It's not what you get that makes you valuable. It's what you become that makes you valuable. So, Schaefer said, set a goal to become a millionaire for what it will make of you to achieve it. Then he said, when you finally become a millionaire, he said, now, what's important is not the money. I thought, wow, I've got some more to learn. He said, no, no, Mr. Owen, you could just give the money away. Now, I did better than that, right? I told you I lost it all. I'm rich by the time I'm 31. I'm a millionaire. I'm broke by the time I'm 33. So I didn't have to give it all away. I lost it all. Foolish mistakes I made. I'm a farm boy from Idaho. That early money drove me bonkers. I used to say, how many colors does it come in? I'll buy them all. I just went crazy over that first money. I just went crazy. And then I made that one foolish mistake, writing guaranteed. I mean, you know, I'm so naive off the farm. I don't know. Compound interest and a few other mistakes. And by the time I'm 33, I'm broke. Now, I've made and lost millions since then. But what an experience that was. And I'm telling you, the man was right. When I finally was broke at age 33, guess what I discovered? My money did not mean that much. It represented only a fraction of all my assets. Schaefer said, once you become a millionaire, Mr. Owen, you can give all the money away. Because he said, what's important is not the money. What's important is the person you become. What a whole new concept on setting goals. Now, there's two parts to this. And then we're wrapping up goals. Here's the first part. Now, on this goal setting for what you become. 1. Don't set your goals too low. Interesting. We teach in leadership, don't join easy crowds. You won't grow. Go where the expectations are high. Go where the demands are high. Go where the pressure is on to perform, to grow, to change, to develop, to read, to study, to develop skills. I belong to a small group. We do business around the world. You cannot believe the expectations at that level. What we expect of each other in terms of excellence, far beyond average. Why? So that we can each grow, so that we can receive from the group. We can contribute to the group something unprecedented. It's called living at the summit. Go where the demands are high. Go where the expectations are high. So that it'll provoke you, push you, urgently insist that you not remain the same for the next couple of years, the next five years, that you'll grow and change. So don't set your goals too low. The guy says, well, I don't need much. Well, then, you don't need to become much. Now, here's the last part on setting goals. Don't compromise. Don't sell out. There were some things I went for back in those early years that I paid too big a price for. If I'd have known how much it was going to cost me, I never would have paid. But I didn't know. Don't sell out. An ancient phrase says, count the cost. Count the cost. An ancient story says, Judas got the money. You say, well, that's a success story. No, no, it's true. 30 pieces of silver in those days was a sizable fortune. You say, well, if a guy's got a fortune, right, that's a success story. No, you don't understand. His name is Judas. Doesn't that ring a bell? Judas? You say, oh, yes, Judas, Judas the traitor. That's right, the traitor got the money. Doesn't that change the story? And the answer is, of course it changes the story. Let me give you my best opinion. I get paid staggering money for my opinion, so please write it down. Here's my opinion. Each person's philosophy is a major factor in how your life works out. Each person's philosophy is the major factor in how your life works out. I want to be as emphatic as possible because I truly believe it. Up until I was 25, that would never have occurred to me that my personal philosophy was the major factor. If you would have known me when I was 25 years old and you would have said, Jim Ron, how come you find yourself here? This is pitiful. Living in America, you're broke. You got zits in your pocket. You got nothing in the bank. Creditors are calling. You're behind on your big mouth promises to your family. You've been to at least one year of college. How come you find yourself in this pitiful position? 
If you would have asked me that question when I was 25, it never would have occurred to me to blame my philosophy. That would not have occurred to me. I would not have said to you, well, I got this lousy philosophy. What else would you expect? That would not have occurred to me. You don't jot those little phrases down. Shoulda, coulda, don't. Here's what we call that. Formula for disaster. And all you've got to do to start now the process of life change is to start somewhere. And it doesn't even matter where. You can start with good health, or you can start with something else. The key is to start by saying, I'm going to start the process in each category, finding by my own research. And that's why seminars are so valuable. That's why information is so valuable. That's why somebody willing to take the time to share is so valuable. Just to help boil it down in some form to the half a dozen, few things that take care of most of it. And then, oh, let me get on with practicing it. And where you start doesn't matter. The process of life change can start with as simple a process as an apple a day, which means I'm on the road to cleaning up neglect. I'm going to walk around the block. I'm going to get the next book of my new library. I'm going to get a journal. She taught me to keep a journal. She said, don't just let ideas get by you. Don't trust your memory if you're serious about really becoming an entrepreneur. If you're serious about affecting other people's lives, if you're serious about fortune, if you're serious about wealth and health, if you're serious, start collecting ideas. Go over them and review them, then make them a part of your life and practice. And don't ever look back. That formula helped change my life, brought me to where I am today, and I'm so delighted now to have the opportunity to go around the world telling the same story that I heard when I was 25 years old. There's a few basic things, and if you practice them every day, I'm telling you, there's no reason why you can't have the help you want, the relationship you want, the fortune you want, the money you want, the income you want, the sophistication you want, the culture you want, the prestige you want, the influence you want, all of it. It's wrapped up, I think, in a nutshell of what I've just explained to you, a few things. Now let me give you one more part of it. Here it is. Once you've found the few things that make the most difference, now spend most of your time working on those few things. That's another part of the clue. The first part of the clue is to get the information and consistently practice it. But here's the rest of the formula. Spend most of your time on it. The reason why a lot of people don't do that well is because they major in minor things. They spend too much time on things that don't count much, and they spend too little time on things that would count. Here's a guy in the last 10 years who's bought 2,000 donuts and two books. And this guy says, you know, my life isn't working well. Well, anybody in this audience could give him a seminar right once we knew these numbers. Here's what we might suggest to this guy. Hey, this may be one of your major problems. In the last 10 years, you've spent too much money on donuts and not enough money on books. You've spent too much money feeding the body and not enough money gathering food for the mind. And it's not the miracle of your body that works out your future, it's the miracle of your mind. That if you nourish the body and neglect to nourish the mind, I'm telling you, you're going to have all kinds of problems and all kinds of difficulties. So, we would suggest one of our suggestions in our seminar to this man would be, in the next 10 years, spend a lot less money on donuts and a lot more money on books. Food for thought, bread for the head, we call it. You've got to have ideas that feed your mind, not just your body. And the miracle of the mind is so fabulous to work out your future, to give you all the equities you could possibly hope for, to give you every dream and every treasure you could possibly want for you and your family and the people you care most about. It's all available, but it is a very basic, simple process. Once you've found a few things, spend most of your time and money working on those few things. Okay, we call these basics, fundamentals, another good word. If you're going to play football, you've got to learn the fundamentals. And there's about half a dozen. It'll make you good at it if you practice those half a dozen. A few other things, yes, but the half a dozen are what's important to lay the groundwork. Basics, fundamentals. Now let's talk about the fundamentals of life. Let me give you this little series to jot down. Fundamentals of life. There's just a few. There's just a few fundamentals of life, about half a dozen. There's just a few. Here's number two. Once you know them, you know them. I mean, there's nothing difficult here. It's pretty easy to figure out why people are broke, 
and it's pretty easy to figure out how people get rich. Just no big deal. Fundamentals of life. One, there's just a few. Number two, once you know them, you know them. Now here's three. There's no new ones. Written history is what? About 6,000 years. There's nothing new here. Now, there might be a new way to say it. There might be a new way to apply it to the 21st century. Getting ready for century 21. But this stuff is basic. It's old. It's fundamental. So, be aware of somebody who comes along and says, we've got new truth. They know, you can't have new truth. Truth is old. So, be a little suspicious if the guy says, we're manufacturing antiques. If you've got to come watch our, wouldn't you be a little suspicious? You say, no, you can't manufacture antiques. Antiques are what? Old. So, be a little suspicious. The guy says, we're manufacturing antiques. Wouldn't you be a little suspicious? You say, no, you can't manufacture antiques. Antiques are what? Old. Now just because you've discovered it, there's no sign it's new. Say no, truth is old. The fundamentals go way back. The fundamentals of sowing and reaping go way back. The fundamentals of good and evil go way back. I mean, there's nothing new here. Oh, what we need to do though is just bring our intellectual discovery process to bear and see if we can't find those few things. Then the rest of it is to get busy practicing those few things. We might all agree on one philosophy. This is where the value of human life begins to show versus all other life forms. I call it simply a guidance system. Settling on certain questions and making decisions about what direction in life you're going to take. Setting goals, making plans. This guidance system, boil it down to each one's personal philosophy. A guidance system, and we all need it. A guidance system for two reasons. One, to avoid the dangers. Somebody's got to give us some clues first on how to avoid the dangers. And two, to take advantage of the opportunities. To see and understand the opportunities. Take advantage, and to avoid the dangers. It's about as simple as I can put it. A guidance system, necessary to do that. While we listen to ideas, whether they come from me or from someone else, be a collector of good ideas. Get more serious about altering the course of your life. And you can, regardless of what happens in the next five years, getting ready for the turn of the century. You can wind up where you want to be. The money, the joy, the pleasure, the satisfaction. Now, what is philosophy? If it's so important, I teach kids how to be rich by 40, 35. If you're extra bright, much sooner if you find a unique opportunity. Kids say, hey, that sounds good to me. How do I do it? And I say, it starts with your philosophy. So kids ask me, what is philosophy? It's kind of a big word, so I've broken it down for them, made it easier for me to understand. Here's my definition of philosophy. Philosophy comes from one, the collection of all that you know. Gathering knowledge is the first key to developing the philosophical set of sale. And then number two, deciding which of this information is valuable enough to bet your money and your time. That's about as simple as I can put it. To change the set of sail, regardless of the wind that blows, first, you search for knowledge. Then you've got to sort through it and decide which of it is valuable enough to spend money and time. That is one of the best equations I know. You might know 1,000 things, but you can't do 1,000 things. But you've got to sort through a lot of information and be it down to the things that really matter to you and utilize that as the most important pieces, deciding what's valuable. So first of all, we've got to gather knowledge. When I have a chance to talk to my high school friends, first thing I tell them is, you've got to have the information. Get it while you're here. Don't leave school without it. It's one of my little phrases for my high school friends. What they teach here, what you think of it, that's up to you. What you're going to do with it, that'll be up to you. But right now, this is the important thing, is to get it. You can sort through it. You can cast aside whatever is not going to work for you in the future. But the important thing is to be serious enough to get it. Okay? Teach them. There's nothing worse than being stupid. Being broke is bad, but being stupid is what's bad. And what's really bad is being broke and stupid. Nothing much worse than that, unless you're sick. Right? Take, broken, stupid. That's about as negative a scenario as you can get. Unless you're ugly. Surely that would do it. Ugly, sick, broken, stupid. Life's most negative scenario. So one, you've got to know. 
You've got to have the information. Now, where do we get ideas and information? We've got this marvelous ability here, unlike any other life form on Earth, to alter the course of our lives. You don't have to keep flying as if South is not getting you the money and the joy and the pleasure, telling you can alter the course. You're not just like a blind animal that has to be driven by instinct in the genetic code. So if we want to change our life, we've just got to use this marvelous mechanism to gather more ideas and information and see if it'll pay off for us. So where do we get this? We've got this down. 1. From personal experience. Just make it a point from now on to learn more from your own personal experience. It's probably the best university in the world. Your own personal experience. You've been through enough that could teach you. Personal experience. A lot of the questions from your personal experience, why the answers from your personal experience. Learning is the beginning of wealth. Learning is the beginning of health. And here's where it can all soar. Paying more attention to your own personal experience. One way to learn to do it right is what? Do it wrong. That's one way to learn. Now, the key is don't want to take too long. If you've done it wrong for 10 years, we suggest that's long enough. We don't suggest 10 more years just to prove a point. Now, you can prove any point in 10 years. In 10 years, your health disciplines will be on track or off track. Your financial independence will be on track or off track. It doesn't take that long to come to the conclusion based on your own personal experience whether you're on track or off track. In a few years, you've either got the breath or you haven't got the breath. You've got the money or you haven't got the money. You've got the self-esteem or you haven't got the self-esteem. I mean, it doesn't take much from your personal experience. Dell was swift to point out, my personal experience said let's learn from that. He said, Owen, you've been working six years. I said, yes, sir. He said, how are you doing? I said, not very well. He said, I suggest you not do that anymore. What a swift analysis of my current situation. He said, couldn't we find out what happened the last six years so that you can alter the course of the next six years? That had never occurred to me. He said, I'm telling you, we can learn so much from the last six that we can make the next six years totally different than the last six. And that's exactly what he did for me. That second six years, my life so swiftly changed, it was absolutely incredible. At age 25, I was broke. At age 31, I was rich. And he said, Mr. Owen, if you'll make these changes starting today, he said, the next six years of your life will be totally different than the last six. I took him up on that. So now let me give you that promise in case you have to leave early. Here's a promise that changed my life. For your notes, he said, if you will change, everything will change for you. If you will change, everything will change for you.